everyone. Come join us. Come join us. Yeah. Come join us. Yeah. Come join us. You didn't time yourself, right? Oops. Yes, and apparently he just he's like generous and not doing it every 20 seconds, but to practice it with automate automatically go to the next slide, so I'm doing this hard code. What? Hi. Uh, my name is Alex and I am going to speak about how uh, we are going to make 3D content in the future, or at least what I think it's going to be. Uh, have any of you seen Fifth Element? I'm basically creating Fifth Element the video game. You are a, a cab driver in a big futuristic city, and in order to do that, I have to create a lot of 3D models. This is the normal flow for creating 3D models. You start with the concept art, you then have a rough outline that then is turned into the final artwork. Um, this works well for like smaller projects, but when you have a whole city to populate, it gets a lot trickier. The normal approach is to hire in a big team, but that's really expensive, and also you have to like align the whole team to uh, like your vision. So instead, I'm trying to be smart and actually develop a tool specifically for creating the content for my game. And I'm looking in two different directions. One is um, looking more into what actually makes a building a building. Well, it's always like uh, patterns repeating. Um, that holds true both if it's like a skyscraper or if it's like terraced houses, even if it's more uh, like unusual buildings, uh, like old buildings or like new architectural things. And that's really good because it means that there are clear rules that we can actually get the computer to, to do for us. All of the levels you see here, that's from my last game, and they're all created in real time as the player is actually inside the game. And it's all just a bunch of rules laid on top of each other. The next thing that is also really interesting is that we now have access to cheap VR headsets. And that gives us two different uh, advantages. One is like stereo vision, we can actually sense depth. And we also have the possibilities of making much more natural gestures. So this is the tool I'm building. It works both in desktop and in VR. Uh, when you're just seeing it on a monitor, like the UI is like stashed away in the corner. But when it's in uh, VR, it's attached to uh, one hand like a palette, and you then use the other one to select what tool you want to use. And there you go. So this is how you create a building. Uh, you select the building tool, you place the center, and then you start tracing out the outline of the building point by point. And when you then uh, connect the loop, you just raise up and you get a building. And as you can see, the tool automatically tiles correctly. That's because there's uh, these uh, like images where I've put in rules for like, uh, like how tall the story is. And it's always going to be like three units or three meters. And there's also this uh, special gap texture that allows you to like fill in uh, holes in the model automatically. Now, this is a futuristic city, and futuristic cities need sky bridges. 
So I've actually created this tool specifically for that, and I, because I'm creating the, this tool myself, I have the, that flexibility to actually create a workflow that is highly specialized exactly for what I need. And as you can see, it's very easy to use because it automatically snaps to the script. Snapping is a bit tricky in VR. Uh, I'm using like a laser pointer metaphor, and when you're moving close to your hand, that's you have a higher level of precision, but further away, it becomes less precise. And I've solved that by having this grid automatically scale to uh, units that fits the distance that you're uh, from it. Navigation noise, uh, you can like you can fly like Superman by like, just pointing the uh, pointer in a specific direction. You can also teleport. The most uh, cool one, in my opinion, is that you can also basically grab the whole world and move it around, rotate it, but also scale it up and down. Um, the tricky thing with locomotion in VR is that uh, if you send different input to your eyes and to your body, uh, you have what's called simulation sickness in some people. And I've solved that by having this like virtual platform that people can like create around them, so they kind of like are grounded um, in the virtual world. This is a very nice thing to find out. Like the game itself is not meant to be played in VR, so you just create like a virtual TV screen. And the first time I did it, I was like, what's that? Oh, it's me! And I was basically like flying around myself, which is a, a quite cool thing. Like, basically like a little radio controlled car. <laughs> Text input is still something uh, I'm working on. Uh, this is the current like uh, approach most people use, where you have like the laser pointer metaphor again. I personally think we're going to see more of this, where you use an accelerometer to like put in specific like uh, individual keys. But also voice input is probably going to be uh, beneficial. Keyboard shortcuts um, is also something we use quite a lot in desktop to speed up workflow. I think in VR, um, a promising approach is basically to have like this coding of like gestures. So you do like one direction, then up, then yeah, you basically create like a series of directions in order to select a specific tool. Moving objects is also there's a bunch of different metaphors around. Um, my favorite so far has been that you can stick the tip of the, the pointer inside the object and then move it around. And if you use both, you can actually scale the object as well. Uh, very intuitive to use. Something I haven't seen other tools uh, use is to actually uh, put in a bit more information about the object, which uh, I've done in my answer. So if it's a trash can, I know it's always going to go on a surface, uh, like horizontally, if it's a sign, it's on walls, <coughs> and if it's something that's floating, this is the future after all, it's just like put in, in midair. There's also a new generation of uh, like these controllers coming out that's going to allow for actual gestures, and I think that's quite interesting. For example, if you're like deleting an object, you could like flick it with your finger and it just flies off, uh, and you can also like use pinching to like scale it up and down. Uh, that's all I had to, to tell you about. I hope I've uh, like given you something to think about and expand the horizons a bit. It is something I've been thinking quite a lot about over the last couple of years, and you could say it's actually gone to my head. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's it. <laughs>Do, is there any questions before we move on? Uh, I'm blind as a bat, so can you pick you? Yep. Yep. You said something about um, that you, you draw a base, you took a base on the building yep. and the top of the building. It sort of seems like that's such a simple thing. Is that, that's not been done before? Is that a common approach? No, not really. Like, there's some um, uh, like level editors that allows you to do like, like that, like gray boxing. But what it doesn't do is like automatically tile the textures. There's not as much like inherent rules for how it should should do the building. It's it's, being, it's basically meant to be much more generalized for creating any kind of 3D environment. And I know that I'm only going to create cities with this tool, so I can put in a lot more constraints uh, to help me. Is your game actually creating cities? Is that is that what you go about doing? Is that that's the purpose of the game? <laughs> no, it's, it is actually the driving around. Um, okay. But like the tool has definitely taken just as much like as much time as like developing the gameplay of the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it is with the goal that the tool is also going to be available to the players. Um, so 
quite often when you're like developing a game, like when you come to like the actual release, you have like this like period where you don't have any more, like more content to put out, and if you then have a way for the players to create their own like levels and content, yeah. and maybe even mod the game to like make it completely different from what you envision, you basically keep the game alive for a long. Um, I think Half, half I, I don't know, I'm not a gamer, but Half Life is a, is a, right back in the day. Sorry, Half Life. Yes, the reason why Half Life got so popular was because it was like such a powerful tool for its day. Like, yeah. Mm. Um, Cool. Yeah. Any more? No? No. Great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Do you want to load up on my machine? Yeah. Yeah. One call. What kind of uh, file is it? There's a folder full of JPEGs. Uh huh. Okay. Okay, so that's fine. Is that right? Are you scrolling through this? Uh, no, I've run out of time to do that today. Oh, okay. I was writing a script for it. Yeah. Um, let's get you two. Let's get you two. Great. No, be the one numbered in the right order. Yeah. yeah. Loving the action. Is that in the right order? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. fossil fuels out of the world economy. However, um, while left of centre Europeans like me want more public spending, history shows that people rarely vote for more taxes, even when they say they want better schools or public transport and more hospitals. Politics is becoming increasingly tribal and post-truth, so carbon taxes are going to be a very difficult sell. So there were two proposals on carbon dividends, one from a UK think tank, the other from a, a Republican group, which I'll give you the details of later. Now because these come from the right, they may be able to gain support for carbon taxes from right-leaning voters, which I think is vital if carbon taxes have any chance of surviving successive changes in government. So what is a carbon dividend? Well basically governments would set up carbon taxes at around $40, euros, pounds per tonne. And that means that prices of goods would increase because the world economy depends on fossil fuel. But the carbon tax revenue is then returned to the citizens as a regular dividend, with everyone getting the unequal payment. Um, the carbon taxes would be ring fenced the dividends, so governments can't use the carbon taxes for general expenditure or even programmes to fight climate change, because otherwise the fossil fuel lobby would attack them as, a, as the government just taking money and not giving us anything back. So who would lose out of the dividend? Well, it should be the wealthiest because a uh, 2013 uh, Roundtree Foundation study found that the people with the top 10% of incomes produce three times as much carbon as the people with the lowest 10%. So the rich would pay more in tax, but would get uh, the same dividend as anybody else. Now, in some cases, the poorest could lose out. So, for example, someone living alone in the country in, a, in an old house with an old four or five boiler. So these cases would have to be identified and support given. Um, there's also the possibility, though, of borrowing against future dividends for people to be able to install extra insulation or newer heating systems. In a way, a carbon dividend is a type of income redistribution because everybody qualifies for the same payment, but the rich do pay in more. So it could even be considered to be a very small step towards universal basic income, which is something we'll probably need with a 
more in the automation and labour market. So a potential problem of uh, carbon taxes is that the this, um, border. So although the UK has actually done really well in uh, decarbonising the energy grid, we're down to 50% of renewables last year. Because we import so many goods from countries like China that have lots of coal on their grid, our carbon emissions per person are actually going up. Um, to stop the shifting of going green, there's, um, for countries that, that have a similar carbon tax system, the, the tax is added to the imported goods, perhaps based on the average level of, um, of carbon in the energy grid of that country. So a carbon dividend may help to price fossil fuels out of the world economy. However, the dividend is using a free market tool to deal with a, a basic failure in our species to take responsibility for the long term, and free market economics haven't yet managed to clean up our planet. So, so here's a couple of issues that weren't discussed in the two proposals. Uh, what if the oil producers suddenly decide they don't want to play ball? Oil is a unique product because producers can affect the price simply by varying their production. So what if the oil producers increase production in order to drive down the oil price? A lower oil price could cancel out the carbon taxes and stifle investment in renewables while we just carry on burning out the fossil fuels. But what about if they do the opposite? So, they produce the, so the oil producers restrict production in order to drive the oil price up, which causes economic chaos until politicians are forced to abandon the carbon taxes. So another key issue is that politicians would have to resist the would have to resist industries pushing for exemptions. So take aviation for example. Unlike electric cars, electric aircraft are technically a very long way off. So even though air fuel is actually only around five percent of your ticket price, the industry will lobby to be made exempt. But several companies can produce carbon neutral fuels by literally sucking hydrocarbons out of the air. Um, carbon engineering in Canada can produce synthetic fuel for about 25% more than standard fuel. Uh, so there will be carbon tax added to the standard fuel, but not to the synthetic carbon neutral fuel. Now as the carbon tax rises, the standard fuel price will, will eventually become matching the, uh, the untaxed synthetic fuel. And then the synthetic fuel will probably get cheaper as production increases. So potentially aviation could be made carbon neutral within the space of a decade or so. But that would only be possible if the true cost of carbon is paid across all sectors. Now there are other issues which I can't go into the blog post, uh, which I put on my blog post, but I can't go into here about things like deregulation and inflation. But overall it's a good idea and it should find support even by climate sceptics, because there are other reasons for humanity to get off fossil fuels quite soon. If you remember a thing called peak oil, the world economy depends on finite fossil fuels. But the easily accessible stuff is mostly gone. Fracking, deep water drilling and tar sands oil are signs that we are literally scraping the barrel. The world needs an infrastructure update to infinite renewables, regardless of climate change. And there's a revolution possible in energy which includes social change, things like increased car ownership, a transport gig economy and resource sharing. You know, cars sit unused 90% of the time. Electric cars are actually mobile battery packs, which could be um, which could help to stabilise the energy grid. And new Nissans already have this vehicle to grid capability. So the fossil fuel industry has managed to convince us that replacing fossil fuels would be costly, but fossil fuels are fundamentally dirty and limited, whereas renewables will only increase in their efficiency. The question is who's going to pay for who's going to pay for the transition, and with a dividend, hopefully it won't be the average person.
Yeah, and because that's the, as we get more real results of the grid, there is a problem with stabilising. And you know, Britain's done a very good job because we've got enormous wind farms, especially on Scotland, large blade wind turbines. But it does change the, you can actually, you can actually detect it by um, the frequency varies around 60 hertz. And as it goes above it, that's because there's excess energy coming in from the renewables. And the grid is strong enough to adjust. If you had lots of electric cars plugged in, they're just little, they're just, they're sitting there, they can take extra synergy off when there's too many renewables coming from, from windmills and then feed back in when there's a, when there's a, when it's dropping. Yeah, I mean, so, the electric cars is a battery with wheels. Yeah, and exactly, yeah. The, the battery has the potential to democratise <coughs> and yeah. the battery and the people that are going to pay, the battery is going to make money, yeah. like the Tesla yeah. one. Yeah. In fact, Nissan say that, the, that it actually helps the, the battery. They've, they've done this, they've, they've done some tests on it, and they reckon that it actually helps the battery to have this kind of control, charge, and discharge. Strange. So, yeah. Do you know if there's any countries that are considering putting in such a limit? Well, the, um, what's interesting about it is that this is a proposal from 2017 by a Republican Libertarian group. It's got people from, I mean, it's like James A. Baker, who was George Bush's Secretary of State, and it's got Exxon, who are actually, in theory, on board with it. So, to me, this is this is where it, it this is what it absolutely needs. It needs the Republican and Libertarian right to buy into it, because there's just no way there's enough people on the left to be able to persuade the general population that we need carbon taxes. Um, so, by, what they do, what they come up with is a kind of free market mechanism, because then they can say to people, "Look, we've got this great free market mechanism that's going to solve the problem." Um, and so they they are talking about it, and I think they are talking about where they're going to put their money for presidential candidates in 2020. So there's kind of background, you know, there's bits of talk going on in the background, but you never know. You know the fossil fuel industry is extremely powerful. They have lobbyists that work for the tobacco industry before. So it's going to be very difficult to overcome that. That's why I think possibly the is the way to go, because it's such a common sense, simple way of doing it. Perhaps. Mm. Sorry, did you think mm. yes. I was going to ask about um, the problem of having to impose taxes internationally. Yeah. Um, aviation is a great example where, you know, if one country taxes it, then you just fill up with fuel Somewhere at the else. other end of your well, journey. Well, you wouldn't be able to with a plane because you, you wouldn't just fly, you know, you fly into Heathrow and there's taxes there. You can't just go, oh, I'm just going to fly it to... We're going to fly it to North Korea. Or no, no. But if you're flying, if you're flying between Heathrow and Paris, you yeah, can, you yeah, can. yeah, yeah. I think probably it would need it would need some kind of unity across Europe and you know between America and Europe and so on. Um, but the idea was that the that if you if a country doesn't have those carbon taxes, then as their goods come in, you, you impose carbon taxes because they're based it's based on sales tax, the same as VAT, but it's it's based on carbon emissions. And then when you export goods, you take you take your carbon tax out of it, so that the other other countries can impose theirs. But yeah, it, it's, it's actually in those two proposals. That's one thing that's discussed in detail. There's a number of things I think they've missed, but both that carbon bordering is actually quite well discussed. Great, thanks, thanks so much. Think about it. Uh, right, so as there are, is there anyone else who wants to give an impromptu talk? I've got a talk. Yeah. Yes, great. <laughs> Do you want to pass that down? Thanks. What are you doing talk about? Oh, website, okay. It's got uh, auto, uh, the slide sheet change. Ah, uh, cool. What's it written in? Uh, it's on Python. Do you have Python? Uh, I don't have Python. Do you have something that you can play? It will come up in um, Keynote. It doesn't have Python. Do you think it is able to be transferred? Ah, it says patch up, patch up. This one? Yeah, so open in yeah. and then I would like it to work automatically. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah, let's try. Um, um, yeah, I don't 
Okay, well, I mean, we should change it every day. Turn it off. So I told my friends I was going to do this talk, and they gave me some advice. I said that at the beginning, make sure you have a really good opening line. I said have a really strong line in the beginning. So I had one in the bathroom before I came up, and um, I can say I'm feeling, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I'm here to talk. <laughs> I'm here to talk about uh, thinking, and not just any kind of thinking, but uh, careful, rational, analytic thinking, logical thinking. The kind of thinking that gets a bad reputation for being a bit cold and calculating and human. And I think there is reason for this, because it's not always appropriate to think like that. I was dating a girl once, I still remember it, and um, I came home in a bad mood, and she said to me, um, what's up? And I said, I don't know, I feel like I'm stuck in a rut. And she said, look, the world is a vast place, anything is possible. Um, and I said, anything is possible. She said, anything is possible. I said, can a triangle have four sides? And she said, no, no, you're right, a triangle can't have four sides. Not anything is possible, it's impossible for you to not be an asshole. <laughs> so it's not always appropriate to think like that, but I think in certain situations, it's the best thing, it's the most important thing you can do. For example, imagine they are asked to vote in a referendum. Now obviously the government wouldn't actually trust the British public to vote on anything serious, but stay with me. Uh, you're asked to vote in a referendum, and you're a kind, caring person, right? But that's not really enough. You need to work out which vote is most likely to protect the people that you care about. You need to look at the arguments of both sides and analyze them, look at their respective merits in relation to your personal responsibility. Or take another case. You're walking down the street and this hippie comes up to you and he says, hey man, we need to legalize drugs. And you're like, why? He's like, if we legalize them, they're going to be safer, they're going to be cheaper, and the taxes and they come rolling in. And after getting over your initial surprise that a hippie is advocating a policy on the grounds that's going to increase government revenue, <laughs> you might begin to wonder whether or not what he's saying is actually true. And to work out whether or not it's true, you need to look at more than just current drug usage, and you need to look at more than just predicted tax revenue. You need to work out how cash flow works in gangs, the government's ability to regulate new markets, the addictive qualities of certain substances, the psychology of giving people permission to do something, and ultimately, you have to look at political philosophy and ask yourself, what is the role of government? What's the government for? So there's a whole number of different fields that you can have to analyze to get to the bottom of this question. So it's clear that in certain situations, we're going to have to think logically. So great, let's, let's all just think logically, right? Simple. The issue is that thinking is a bit like running. We all know it's a good idea, but that doesn't change the fact that it's really painful and unpleasant. It makes you sweaty. Um, and there are only two ways to deal with painful things. One is to find an alternative which has the same benefits, but which is less painful, or find a way to make activity less painful. For example, with thinking. If you want to get the benefits of thought without enjoying its tortures, you can read a book. Right? You can still learn new things about the world, you can get some great ideas, and you don't have to tax your own mind too much. Or, on those awful situations in which you do have to think for yourself, heaven forbid, you can discuss the idea with someone else, you can jot down your ideas, you can use a calculator, things like that. Uh, for the past year, I've been developing a tool which allows you to do both. It allows you to outsource your thinking, and it makes thinking easier. And it's not a drug. It's something even better than drugs. It's a website. <laughs> for good reason. <laughs> Don't care what you uh, It allows you to think less because uh, it gives you a repository of logical items and an easy to read way and the tools for analyzing the relation. So unlike a newspaper, in which you get a headline and an article which waves between lies and bullshit, you've got a series of detailed claims related in such a way to provide compelling reasons to believe a conclusion. And when it does come, come time to think for yourself, which you have to, because even if you've got a logical argument, you start to work out, is it a good one? Things are made easier by a whole host of tools, of viewing which premises aren't proven, are there some objections to it, is this compatible with my existing beliefs, what are the consequences of rejections and claims, and so on. And it also provides tools for writing um, arguments, submitting arguments, such that it's easy to specify the ways of doing practices, and such that part of your argument can be outsourced to someone else. So you'll be forgiven if this will sound a bit abstract. Let me give a concrete example. Imagine that you're a journalist, and you're writing about the Qatar 2022 World Cup. 
And you ought to say that people shouldn't watch it because of the way that the migrant workers who built the stadiums have been treated. Now, to do this, you're going to need to show that the Qatari government is in some way complicit in this. And to do that, you're going to have to look at Qatari legislation. And you might, you know, you have a vague understanding of law, we all do, but you're not an expert. Fortunately, a lawyer on the website has already put the detailed claims about Qatari legislation there, which you can use. You're also going to need to talk about uh, the organization of FIFA and how they're responsible. Uh, and luckily, an avid football fan, well, you're not there, like, they've already written a ton of syllogisms on there, demonstrating how power is delegated and how are a classic football fan, so that you don't have to do that yourself. So, when it comes down to writing an article, it's easy to make a rich tapestry from various fields to demonstrate why we should work with the FIFA World Cup. Uh, got the last part. Uh, okay, so you could be wrong, but your readers will be in a good position to work out if you are wrong because the tools of the website provide them with. So we all have to make decisions, and making difficult decisions requires more than just being loving and kind and brave and so on. It requires that you actually think. And I want to help people make these difficult decisions. And I would like you to help me, to help people, to help themselves to make these decisions. So if you know anything about um, web development or logic or marketing, um, I would like to speak to you. In fact, if you know anything about, about uh, any field of human understanding, you can probably help with the website because it should be more comprehensive than Wikipedia, ultimately. Um, so yeah, that's all really. Thank you very much for listening and I'll like to speak to you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any questions? Well, he said. Uh, <laughs> yes. How the heck did you get your timing so good? <laughs> uh, I just might have a few times. <laughs> That's what's <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, you said that it would be, say, a lawyer who could get a ticket out to take on the Qatari government or something. How do you feel, how do you stop that from becoming something that's of special interest in just posting information? This, this, this. We, we, uh, social media is full of ideological silence where people, people learn things that they, they're just being told to that they already believe. Mm -hmm. Are you saying like we'll become an echo chamber or? Well, yeah, yeah, it could be. But people will either come and go, well, I'm going to reject that because it doesn't fit my opinions. Or they'll not accept it because it will really because they're, they're something they already believe. I think mean, <coughs> people are very emotional in that they're, they're, what they believe is rational is actually based on an emotion in the first place. Mm -hmm. so, I think, I think that's a fair point. I don't think that I can solve human psychology, but I think that if you have to, you can't submit stuff that's not a logical item on the website. So if there's no real good reason at the bottom of your belief, it will be apparent. People will see, okay, you've got three premises which are all a bit ambiguous and uncertain, and you haven't justified them, so yeah. it's not very compelling. Whereas this guy, we can go really far down the rabbit hole and we get to the bottom like A equals A, and that's why it's right. Um, so hopefully, so I mean, it does require sort of a certain commitment to being rational. Yeah. So how to rule the system? Not very, not very straightforward. It's not like Wikipedia. On Wikipedia, like, like all the pages agree with each other. Um, there's like a side-wide consensus. I don't want to do that. I'm happy for the one page to say you should watch it, one page to say you shouldn't, one page to say that the other's flat. I don't mind that. I just think that at the end of the day, um, you wouldn't be able to find very good reasons to prove that the other's flat. I know somebody who does believe the others flat. But do they have good reasons? <laughs> they believe they have. And I'm okay. They really believe they have. Okay. It's a risk, yeah. That's a fun one. So, how is it actually going to work? Like, are you going to have like uh, someone ask a question and then like people submit answers to it? Like, what's the? It's what's the interface going to look like? I mean, it's 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 live. It's live now. It looks really nineties, like Web two point um, It's really. <laughs> It looks like uh, just like a kind of grid, to be honest. It's, there's no like asking questions, just submitting items. Um, so let's say I have an item like premise one, premise two, premise three conclusion. You can object to premise one, but when you object, you have to write an argument which concludes not premise one. I have to literally conclude not premise one. Um, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a bit like the mathematical way you might disprove an argument by, you know, proving it by proving something else wrong. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> So sorry, are you um, are you theming it? 
So you're going to start with, say, the environment or politics? That's a good idea. You just go. There's <laughs> 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 someone else that's me, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to do that, yeah. Right. <laughs> Any suggestions of things? The environment thing? Well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, like, you should, you should put in, like, a question mechanic where you can, like, write in, like, uh, does cell phone towers cause pregnancies or, or whatever? And then that's put in as an app. They do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that's like, like if there isn't like a topic that or like a, an argumentation that, that fits that, it's like put in as something that there's a need for. That's a good idea. I know it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, like then that, that way, like it's, it's organic what is like. Yeah. You can maybe you can even have it like on the front page so you actually like talk about like we need this topic to be explored by someone. That, that, I think it's really good idea. Yeah. I think I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very early days. Do you have any other examples? I mean the, the one the the kind of football one is interesting, but do you have like have you got other stuff in your mind or um I I to try and popularize it, I've I did an analysis of an article in The Guardian. What was it about? I can't remember what it's about now. Uh, I also did an answer to a piece on some philosophy blog saying that um, it's always immoral to believe something without evidence. Um, and I sort of put their article into a logical argument and then decided that it was a good one. I don't think it was really. But I think it can, I think it can really be applied to most things when people try to argue. Wasn't great. Yeah. <laughs> just, 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 I would um, somehow build a, a list, a mailing list of people that are interested in it. Yeah. And then I would pick one topic mm -hmm. and say, this is what we believe about this, what we like. And then just see what that list does. Mm -hmm. And then, before you know it, have a little branch of something else to explore and people can populate that. You learn it with a massive tree of iron. <laughs> I would start somehow with one, okay, one thing. thing yeah. How are you going to defend against Russian trolls? So <laughs> <laughs> we're basically just flooded with like, bad documentation. Like that, that's that's another yeah. issue I can see here because like you could like we have fake news. You could definitely also have like fake arguments. Like mm -hmm. they could even like make up like fake academic papers on a fake academic website. Mm -hmm. That's out there to like basically provide the foundation for, for that. Mm. Well right right now I have there's sort of like three versions of the site. One version, they all have like sort of political analogies, one version is like anarchism, anyone can submit anything and anyone can delete anything, even if it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also add everything. Uh, second version is like libertarianism, so like really strong property rights, but basically nothing else. So I submit an argument, I can edit it, I can delete it, no one else can touch it. The administrative website can't touch it. I can give you permission to edit it, so you can help me, but that's it. And then the third version, which is a bit like Wikipedia, where there's like administrators and things like that. So, for the first two versions, there is no way to stop trolls. Um, well, I guess for the first version, I can use the leader. there. Um, but with the third version, yeah, it's just like having like, a team of people who care about the website and who are good at working on what's adjusting and what's not. What's your eventual aim? What part do you want to get to? Uh, so you said bigger than Wikipedia, but what, like what's the, have you got some aspirations? I don't know really, I just, I really like to have a really, just a really large database where when, uh, okay, so let me give, you ask about an example, let me give an example. Um, let's say you're a political journalist and you're talking about a conflict and you appeal to something about the history of the country to explain why there's a conflict, it's quite plausible. Um, when you appeal to that, you appeal to an argument the historian has written. And the historian has um, evidence the argument with something about when, when this castle was made. And they've appealed to carbon dating. Now the historian doesn't know a lot about carbon dating, right? They, they accept that it works, but they don't know how it works. But I don't know who knows about carbon dating physicists. Okay, geologist. That's it, geologist, yeah. He's written the argument that demonstrates what carbon dating work, and he's appealed to some sort of general um, theory of empiricism about the patterns of the history of human future. And a philosopher has just for that. So like it seems like a, just a front page article about uh, world conflict, but it's so well argued that you could go all the way down to the bottom and see, well, this depends on it being true, that um, the laws that held in the past will hold in the future. Which actually, that actually does need to be true for the 
and being too fast with the trip, and only just don't think about it. So that would be my ideal, that everything's so rigorous. Is it, does it rely on referencing or the the person making the argument, the credentials of the person. Okay. So there's like no, there's like no appeal to authority. Um, yeah. It's just the arguments. There's no like links to any other pages. There's no like, oh, it's got a PhD. It's just like, is it good argument or not? That's all there is on the website right now. Uh, well, I think <laughs> <laughs> that we could carry on talking about that all evening. <laughs> Um, because it's very interesting. So thank you. What's your name, Tim? Joe. Joe. Awesome. Thank you. Nice. Um, so has anyone else got anything that they would like to present? Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a brief presentation on a game I made. Um, a slightly lighter... I feel like it's gone like this tonight. <laughs> it's been quite interesting. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish, we'll have more drinks, and then we can all go home and um, wonder what the hell that website was about. <laughs> um, uh, just need to work out where my slide is. There you go. Um, so, those of you who know me, um, or have been to this before, um, we know that I have talked about ethics before, um, but tonight I'm not talking about ethics at all. Um, so I'm going to press play and hope that it goes around. Yes. Um, so I made a computer game and I feel like I have some things during that process of making the computer game that I'd like to share about um, making games. And you know, if you're interested in making games or making things, and how you go about doing that. Um, so the game looks like this. It's called Full Color Tiles. It's a mobile game. You can get it on Android, iOS. Um, you can actually get it on Steam. So you can get it on PC and stuff like that. It's a puzzle game, and the core concept is that it tells you nothing about how to play it. Okay. So you load it up, and it's just like a play button. You press it, and you're in the game, and it tells you nothing about how to play it. Here's a short um, animation of what that looks like. Uh, it's going to ruin my time if this loads like this. Um, there you go. So it buffers. That's what it does. Um, oh, you can ask me afterwards. Um, so why make a game at all, right? So as I was a kid, I would play chess and I'd learn these different kinds of games that you play in the world, you play football and all sorts of things, and I was fascinated by the rule sets, how you make play and how you uh, make logical like, decisions about how to strategically make um, things like this work together. Um, I've been working as a web designer for 10 years and I've been teaching, coding, all sorts of things, and I got to the point where uh, when I was a kid I thought this sort of uh, industry is impossible, you know, how, how the hell do you make these things? And I realised um, when I was about uh, 29 that I had some of the prerequisite skills to do this stuff. Um, I'd been toying around with things, like these are things that I've made. Um, game jams are great, um, that's why I'm Alex. Um, and I made stupid things for friends, I made uh, game jam games, I made just some pixel art and theatre games. Nothing really um, that I made money out of. So I decided that I'm going to make a game that I could publish so I could learn how to um, make uh, a release and do all the post-release um, stuff on a game um, in this world that we live in now. Uh, I chose to use Unity, so a games engine. Um, and very quickly, I got something on my screen. And that's a fantastic feeling, right? So I sat down, and within like a week, I had pretty much the game that I was trying to make my phone, and that blew my mind. So um, that's where these sorts of games engines come in, and they do a lot of the hard work for you. Um, after that, I then spent basically another year and a half <laughs> doing stuff, right? So I made the core concept in a, a week, and then I spent pretty much the rest of a year and a half like making lists and doing all sorts of random stuff. Um, to, to make this, you know, what is essentially quite a, you know, slightly different from what we saw earlier, but, um, you know, sort of similar. 
Um, so it, was, it came down to animation, it came down to promotion, um, testing, testing all the time, different levels, and making things work well. Um, this is an example of one of the random things I decided to do because if you're a coder, you decide to distract your thing that's yourself with either making code better or making code which doesn't really need to be there at all. Um, and this is a, a level editor that makes itself. So this is a generative um, thing. So I, I can set it going and it will make 200 levels. And they're all crap and they look like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one rainy Saturday, I decided to make the machine make me all the levels. And um, eventually, I decided that actually this is a great tool for inspiring myself. So I got to the point where I had all these uh, ideas of how to make levels. And I needed inspiration, and that was the inspiration I could take. And most levels are crap, but I could take what I needed from them. Um, one of the other great things about um, making these creative things is being around other people who are also making creative things. Uh, so this is a uh, picture of Games Hub. Um, being around people who are also making games is super useful. Um, and this is one of the philosophies which I didn't know I was going to come to during this process, which was how much content is enough content? There you go, it's an open question. Um, so if you've ever played uh, Two Dots, right? So Two Dots is a game for your mobile phone. Two Dots has, thousand, has at least a thousand levels. And in my mind, that's too many levels, right? Because you're never gonna get to the end of that feeling satisfied. You're, you're probably mental, okay, if you've got through a thousand levels of Two Dots. Uh, whereas mine has 70 currently, which is probably too few, possibly, but it's an open question. Um, most of my time needed to spend promotion because um, uh, when you make a game, it's, there's no guarantee that anyone's going to buy it, anyone's going to um, have it downloaded, um, it's going to see anyone, to be honest. So um, what I regret doing in this process is not spending enough time on promotion. Um, one of the great things about, um, about this process is when you actually get it inside someone's, um, in, their, in front of them, and they play it and they enjoy it, and that's what the last slide was about: is you know seeing kids, seeing adults play it, and then really getting a lot out of that um, process. Even if it's giving people your prototype and, and testing it and seeing how they react, uh, that was really amazing. Um, so after we launched, you get all these nice analytics now. If you're using these uh, software packages, um, you can see I have some users. That's all great. This is like how many people are coming in. It's not great per se. Um, so this comes down to promotion again. And to be honest, I don't actually mind because I'm, this was a learning process for me. But it's something I need to do better next time. So I need to do better promotion. Um, I need to work out what success is. Like success in the last project was just producing something and putting it in someone's hands and getting them to download it. I could tell, I could send someone an email saying, download it off the App Store, you know, to the US or China, or something, and they can do that. You know, and that's fantastic. Um, at the moment, I'm working on some, um, a nib ball game, which looks a bit like this. Um, these are a couple of prototypes that I'm working on. Um, they're all kind of puzzly games, and they look like crap at the moment, but that's how you start out anyway. So, thanks. <laughs> um, yes, I love gifts. They're good, aren't they? Gifts are great. Gifts are great. <laughs> um, is there any questions? <clears throat> Again, you don't know what the rules are. Yeah. Is it giving you feedback? Do you see the score? Are you getting noises that tell you you're doing the right thing? Yeah. Yes. Um, there is. I, I have had some criticism that there isn't enough feedback. Um, but I think because in some way I'm jaded about the design choices I make from coming from the web world where everything's a bit flat these days, like flat design is a thing. So my the, the, the design of the game is, is quite flat and um, it's not bubblegummy like you know um, Candy Crush and all these other quite popular games are quite crunchy and quite bright and um, exciting. Whereas mine is like, you know, it kind of goes, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then the next level. And then after you complete that level, we'll go, yeah, we go. I was just thinking what you could do is say, um, you can ask people what level of feedback they want. Yes. Yeah. almost no feedback. So when they get to the end and play for it, Half an hour or something, they find out what their score is, and then they kind of, you know, they've got a really great sort of chess mind. Yes, yeah. And they start working out the rules for themselves that way. Yeah. And the less, the less information you give them, the more it becomes the game as to work out what the rules were that they just played
lots of feedback rather than people really going to catch on quite quickly if they're not. Is yeah, so it's, it, I mean, if you, when you play it, it is quite split back, and there is a lot of that in there, but I could take it back a lot uh, more, and it would be kind of like an academic thing well, to so see yeah, what kind of things that people, yeah, yeah. What's the feedback or can't yeah. feedback, you know, anywhere in between? Yeah, I mean, if I was going to do some more rigorous testing, that's, that would be a good thing to do, actually, yeah, for sure. Hmm. Of all the things you tried in terms of promotion, what was yeah. the one that worked best? Uh, I mean, the, so I went to uh, Margate, um, it's called uh, Geek, so that was, um, it wasn't massively great for promotion, there was only so many people at the event, but for me, as a, um, gaining some like insight into how people play and just getting some invigoration about the project itself, that was really useful. So I think um, for my next project, I would probably go to more events like that, uh, more um, expos and getting it into people's hands, um, a lot of people's hands, basically. Is super useful. Um, to be honest, I think I'd work with some marketing person or team going forward because I really struggled. Because you're going from zero basically. Um, so I have you know Twitter followers and stuff like that, but they don't necessarily follow me because I have a game that I'm making. So it's a different thing. Um, so I don't know what the answer is to that, unfortunately. Also, I presume yeah. if people do stumble across it in the app store, you're not describing it very like. You can't, you can't even tell them. Yes. About it. So the strap cool. line is uh, <laughs> a fiendishly simple puzzle game. So it's it and that. Absolutely. So I feel like that sums it up. Um, and I did write a little bit of um, funny copy on it um, in the hope that it might entice people to be like at least amused enough to, to get it. So. It's funny what you say about those like opening questions. Um, yeah. I mean, I've just heard like about a great website where you can like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, uh, if it hasn't been filled in yet, um, like I, I face them in my own like games as well, and what I found is the most efficient way is to like first like go with the gut feeling, go like go in a direction, and then play test as much as possible because yeah. that's when you know that like your assumptions are wrong and like. Uh, like for example, the hover can be actually like being like, oh, the tool is super interesting to make, and it's like, what's yeah. really going to facilitate the whole game? But the play experience is not good enough yet, so I have to keep back and go back and actually work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a really good point. So I mean, I feel like the the, the crux of what I was trying to say with the presentation is about the content thing. That's like my main thing. Just like doesn't I don't know what the answer is to that. Like how much content is enough content? Um, and I, th I think that's an interesting question, but I guess if you play test enough, you probably get to a, a reasonable uh, estimation. Yeah, and at some point, like you're going to get enough experience with like both the market that you're targeting, and mm -hmm. then also like kind of like you're going to become a, big, a better designer and know more like what you're trying to to achieve. Yeah. So a question about what you're looking to achieve in terms of content can be crushed as a huge amount of levels. Yes. So they're just trying to get people into that short, thick, and rush. Yeah. To keep them coming back and buying the add-ons or bits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whereas are you looking for something where they get a sense of satisfaction at the end of completing a challenge? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 70 might be the right number. Yeah, yeah, if exactly. If you it up sufficiently for the yeah. yeah, I mean, I feel like I had to stop because that was the case. You know, I kind of sort of run out of ideas, but also I felt like people were going to drop off at some point because it's like more of the same. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it didn't have that feedback loop that came from the house. Um, but I think if I was going to make another game, which is similar, I'd have to definitely think about that. Like, what is it I want people to feel, almost? You know, and when do I need them to feel it? Because um, at the moment, it's like, at the end of 70 levels, you get through it, oh, you're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of each level, it's, it's less like that, I think. It's less um, impactful, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm sure you play how far they've gone. Uh, they have ways of saying that, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got like a menu with all levels and goals and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And what was the problem you were trying to solve? In making a game at all, um, it was demonstrating that I could. <laughs> yes, to myself, but also externally. So I've made these little uh, projects, but um, what I wanted to do is one, make an indie thing. That I could say I've made a game, etc. Where yay! Um, but secondly, that you know, if a client came to me and they were like, "We want this to be made," uh, 
uh, can you show us any projects you've done? I can go, yes, someone's paying me to do this, I make this on my own, but you know, some portfolio pieces, and I know how the different bits of the journey work. Because up to that point, I had no idea how Steam or um, Apple or Android had their stuff on the stores. Um, so that was, you know, so it's all that stuff. Um, how does that work? And lots, I learned lots of things like um, if you put an app on, on the Play Store and it's free, you can never make it paid because that's one of their um, criteria. So that was a ball ache because I then, so I made my app free and then I made it paid for a pound on iOS and that's fine, but it would never be paid on Android without deleting it and starting again. And I don't really want to do that. So you learn these intricacies by doing the process. Basically. And that's, that's why. Yeah. yeah, and it's painful as well. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do any paid promotion? Pardon, sorry? Did you pay for any promotion? Or has it all been kind of organic? And... Um, no, I don't think I did pay for any promotion, yeah. I thought about it, but I'm, I don't have any money, so <laughs> that's a problem. But yeah, that's something that I would have to do in the future. Because you're basically, the market is so flooded now that you, you you have to do something exceptional to get well, it's I, I just did a search on um, the iOS app store, mm -hmm. and actually somebody's paying for an advertisement against... Against, against my game, yeah. Against yeah, yeah, your yeah. game. But I think it's to do with the, the category it's in, not my yeah. game specifically, yeah. yeah. But it is annoying, for sure. But it was, you know, I did a... Cause yeah. I couldn't remember the name of the game. It yeah. And buy for them, it's this thing comes up and it's... A, yeah, um, yeah. So it's a constant battle with... Um, like I was saying before, it's like now I know that to make any money, I need to spend a lot of time, effort, and also maybe m money on promotion, yeah. on marketing. If I don't do that, I'm not going to make any money. Because your model is, is just the revenue from selling the app. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I was going to um, try and do um, in app purchases, but I ran out of um, enjoyment with the project. <laughs> um, and I wanted to move on to new ideas. And because it was my project, I was able to do that. Yeah. Tell me. It's not really a question, but yeah. okay. Has anyone made it a game that's not on the screen, like for the Echo or something like that, where you don't have to look at it? Like, yeah. Like a voice, like a puzzle game for the Echo or something like that. Because I mean, cause maybe part of your problem is uniqueness in a world of lots of simple puzzle games. Yes. If you do something that's not, it's, it's an old concept, but a new platform. Yeah, we can talk about this afterwards, don't tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and play the, the thing and then we'll stop and we'll have drinks. Um, but yeah, yes, and Apple, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. all these things, they have quite niche audiences. Or maybe like yeah. education space, and now like in schools, yeah. and um, I had a friend who worked at the council and we were talking about some really deprived schools in deprived areas. And children are not phones much of them. Yeah. And they can all learn using, they, they're very tech savvy. So yeah. actually, it's kind of how do you get them to them? But games is a great way. So actually, mm. there's there maybe a big space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's not a market that I know much about, but. Um, if you make a good game that children want, then it would blow up for sure. Uh, and it's something that more of my friends is looking into actually. Um, yes, yeah, it'd be good. Right, well, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you for the talks. So, we'll, uh, we've got another one in the December. Um, the fourth, I think, uh, which is on blockchain. So we've got two speakers who are talking about blockchain. Uh, you don't have to be an expert in blockchain. You just have to come along and be interested in learning about what that is and why it might be, um, you know, not great. Or like, <laughs> what the pitfalls of technology are, let's say. Okay. So we'll see then. Has anyone else got any um, notices, anything coming up? To pitch. Oh, well, I could just pitch. I run the Bristol Bath IoT meetup. Our next meetup is on Monday. We have a couple of speakers, one talking about, my mind's gone completely blank, 
Uh, one's talking about a secure boot, very techy, and the other's talking about uh, wireless networks. And we also have a free raffle on the night with two wonderful prizes, which would suit the uh, techie and nerds amongst you. <laughs> so uh, if you do a look on Meetup for the Bristol Bar Fire team Meetup, you'll find all the details. Cool. I'll do a shout out as well and very briefly, a uh, company I can sell for our recruiting at PHP and a lot of developers. So if anyone knows anyone or is one of those people, then definitely come and chat to me. Happy life for all, it's really good. So. Sweet. Cool, thanks guys. Cheers. I just like to call people out of things. <laughs> you! What, what did you study? Uh, well, I studied a long time ago, but um, I studied 